Okay, I don't know if people have this notebook set up. Can you find this notebook? It's in, um, hmm? uh, this is in my own um, system. It's in um, uh, notebooks. I don't know if it's in your yeah, what's the path? Yeah, it's in hands on sessions, land cover classification of Earth observation images, raster flux, EO classification. Okay, cool. And there's some data that got passed around to go with it. Um, set of, of folders of, of images. sessions okay i'm gonna get started anyway um, um it, yeah the So this is the, the classification TIFF images of the data you're going to use. I'm not sure what for the folder is called. There'll be a bunch of folders with TIFFs in them with different names, the folders. So you should have the fault, the data coming in at a path like this. If you've used it on the command line. Anyway. Does anyone? <laughs> Maybe I should go through that from the start. Is that what you intended? Okay, yeah, but I'm not a Docker guy either. Like, uh, okay, okay, I'll do it like this. All right, sorry. Um, okay, so I'll make this much bigger. So th this is how I run the Docker. I've got the Gale Fogut notebooks latest, the regular command. Uh, how's that? And the edge is off the edge of the screen. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, okay. So actually, uh, No, what? Uh, 
Um, yeah, well, you can here this home slash joy event data. Um, this is the path to wherever the folder is of the data you have. Okay. Um, yeah. We have a zip file. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe it's a bit deeper in. I uh, sorry, I thought you had those files unzipped already. Sorry, miscommunication. Okay. Um we have tried to hear a different thing. We we pick up the, um, the the URL of the, the file, so we put it on on Cruiser and we put it. The URL you mean uh, the from from uh, from the GitHub. So the URL directly from the GitHub. Yeah. Uh, editor, yeah. What? Okay. But, but this is for the data specifically. So I'll just show you how I have the data set up in my system outside of Docker. Um, so the data is these folders. You should see pasture, highway, herbaceous vegetation, stuff like that. And so you'll need to un unzip that to some folder. Call it. I've called it just data. You can call it that too. And then when you use Docker, uh, sorry. yeah, this is the, the command line for running it. So we're saying Docker run minus V homes. So this is the path of my system, um, setting it up here. Oh, actually not classification tiff, sorry. Just data, just to make it simple. Let's just do it like that. Does that make sense? For, for, people, for people using Windows, the local path must be encoded by. Ah, uh, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. Than... Yeah. Um, does that make sense? So then if we run that, we'll have that folder inside Docker when we use it. Um, if you dig into that folder, you'll find the folders that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Hmm? Oh no, you want the the last path? Just yeah, the one all the way in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought you would get that fault that data unzipped already. Okay, and so we can click on this URL and you get your notebooks. Oh, yeah. And I think, yeah, they're not actually in this kernel yet. So, Gail, how are we actually getting the notebooks in from the web? Do you want to just show how to do the URL? The URL? Yeah, the URL of the file of the notebook. So, this one? Oh, the raw. Okay. And then you open Twitter? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, one question is you had this, this uh, Yeah. You had this thing where we have to not running all servers at the same time. <coughs> running all. Of not running the whole notebook at once. So something um, yeah, it doesn't actually work though. So. <laughs> Probably you should try and make the notebook error at the start. Just hit stop so that you can run it man manually. Otherwise, it will try and run all the classification all together at once. Yeah, there's a command to try and stop that, but it's not working in Pluto in, in this setup. Um, okay. 
So did people see what happened there? We've got, we've got this URL from the notebook from the GitHub repository and pasted it into Pluto. And now that's loaded. Okay. All right. Now I'm just going to hit stop on this one so it doesn't try and do the whole thing. If you guys can see there's this little stop button, just hit stop there. It should stop. Anyway, so that I can demonstrate this without it running the whole book, I'm actually going to run it externally. Um, I should wait for people to get, get ready. Disable. Yeah, yeah. I'll go like disable. This one? I'll disable cell. Ah, okay. That will block it. Okay. So if you disable a cell, that should. We just want to stop the notebook running all the way through. There is actually, I don't know why the Pluto developers don't want to make it easy <laughs> to stop the notebook. Um, it's a it's a long standing request, um, but for something like this, you don't want the notebook to run everything. Anyway, um, so probably you have this loading files thing happening for a while um, as you, Julia tries to download and register all these packages. <laughs> is is do people have this screen? Does anyone have this screen? No? What's the problem with getting? Um, yep, so open Pluto. So in Jupyter Lab here, the people, you have this screen, right? Yep, so here, go Pluto. And then in enter your path and URL. Copy the URL from the Git repository. So we find the notebook in the Git repository here. We hit the raw button get the raw version of it, copy that URL. Oh, please, please tell me that. Just tell me. It's in the Julia EO, it's in the docs. So Julia EO notebooks, hands-on sessions, land cover classification of earth observation images. And then the Rustus Flux EO classification session. Just in case anyone hasn't done that yet. People, please give me a, a hands up when they get anything working. If anyone has anything working, can I get no one over here? Okay. So where are you at? Okay. 
Could be the network, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I also have um, these packages not loading. In Docker. Could be the internet. Where are people stuck at? Which no one's on this page yet, right? But you, everyone can get to Jupiter Lab, right? Okay, great. Okay, well, my packages have loaded at least. I did finally open. Uh, Has everyone else got that open now? It, it took it took a long time. Yeah, see the network. Please just let me know when I can move on with this workshop or. Is anyone, there's people still waiting to work anything out? No? You're sorted over there? Okay. You good? You're good? Oh, it's still doing their loading. This is just to get through those. This is not even. It's just yeah. First, it's not even running anything in for it. It's just yeah. run, open. It's just open. And it's ready for the. Okay, um, should I just get started? Is that okay? Yeses, noes? Okay, let's get started and hopefully people can catch up. I'm gonna go kind of slow anyway, so. Um, as you can see here, the packages have all loaded. We've got ticks for everything. And I'm using rasters, flux, plots, stats base. Um, BSON is just to save files. Um, but rasters and flux are the main, and plots are the main things we're using. Thank you. 
Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is just set the number of classes. We're going to analyze to five. There's 10 in the data set all up, but we'll just halve that. Um, and the next is um, from the paper this data comes from, I've got the names of all the layers because actually in the files, it doesn't say what, name, what the layer is, they're just numbered. So you probably want to know whether something's near infrared or blue or red. Um, and actually you see it's blue, green, red, not red, green, blue. So you kind of want to know that. Um, so we make a list of these names and run it. And later in rasters, we're going to name everything with these names. So we have better plots. Okay. I'm going to set the path where the data is. If you've used that same command, it should be the same for everyone. And the first thing I'm going to do is get the names of all the classes of our data. So I guess actually in, um, I didn't do an introduction because we put so much time into getting this started. So the idea of this workshop is to get a bunch of TIFF files. These are like, these are TIFFs with like 12, 13 bands. I think it's 13 bands. So we have um, RGB, but a lot of other indices as well, um, aerosols. And from these, we want to make a classification uh, model that can classify what the land cover is of any particular point. So this data set is thousands of little 64 by 64 TIFFs that have been cut out and someone has manually classified. This is agricultural land, this is urban, this is industrial, this is a road. So we know what those are. We want to train a model to learn what other areas are, new areas that we haven't identified. Um, and I'm no expert in flux.jl at all. Um, so I'm here more to show you the kinds of pipelines to get these data into those tools and get those tools running. But I haven't written a great model that's going to do amazing things. Um, I, the kinds of models I use this for are normally process-based models, so very different internally. Um, but similar, similar kind of pipelines for getting the data in. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. So you can see this, yeah, the notebook's running ahead and, and doing everything for me, actually. So I have to apologize. I'm gonna swap out of the Docker image and just use it off my computer because I wanna show you running these things as we go instead of running the whole notebook. Um, and I can't get that worked out in the Docker image. Okay. Do it again. So we set the path, the number of classes, band names. We can set the class names. So here we're using this read der function from Julia that's reading the names of all the directories in our um, data path. And as you probably saw looking at the data, they classified into the, into the kinds of classifications like agricultural, industrial land. So we get, yeah, annual crop, forest, herbaceous vegetation, highway, industrial. Um, and they're the classes we'll look at today. Um, from that, we can use some string manipulation functions to build the data set. So we have the path of the data and the name classes that we want. And I'm gonna use this join path function to, um, can everyone see that? Is that okay? So, and here you can see we have five paths to these different folders for the different classification data. From that, I'm going to run this um, generator um, to, to collect all of the files in all of those folders. So we want a vector of the names of all of these files that we're going to classify. That makes sense. So um, run that. So we're getting P, which is the path for class path in class paths 
for P in read the um, class path. So for each class path, we'll read the whole directory of TIFF files and we'll join that with the, the, the base path. So we get the full path to the file and the output is this vector of 14,000 TIFF files that we can use to classify. Um, it's good to check your data makes sense. So I'm just gonna plot the first one of those files and see where it is. So we have this file path vector and we'll run plot on it. Um, <laughs> probably noticed in my first notebook, I'd already run plot before we ran the start of the session, but running plot the first time normally takes quite a few seconds. Um, and the new version of Julia fixes this and it's much faster, but at the moment, yeah, it's taking 25 seconds to plot this raster. Hmm. Do people have this running? Notebook? No? Ah, uh, okay. Something to do with the networking and the Docker control. So it's, it takes too long. I, I've seen the, the, uh, the logs of the container and it's, it's so, all sorts of errors having to do with networking. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'll fix right. that for you. You should, you should just move up, move on. Okay. Um, I also have a problem here plotting this. Okay, there's a plot. Normally it doesn't take anywhere near that long. This is a Pluto thing. Um, and it's also plotting with this plots.jl is really slow with this many bands, unfortunately. But you can see we have these TIFF files with like a lot of bands. It's hard to get it in the middle of the screen. Um, and the TIFF file comes with unnamed bands. So we kind of want to know what those are. So I'm gonna use those names we used before to set the, dement the categories of the band dimension to be a name, a string instead of a number. So we can just use this little set function from dimensional data. And here we use band goes to band names, the raster and um, it's taking a little while as well. Okay. Okay, so we've got one of these rasters with named bands. And if I plot that now, hopefully that's a little bit faster. Hmm. Okay, there we go. So now we've got these, um, we've got our data with correctly named bands so we can see what we've got. And um, actually the, the bands to use for this exercise are the, the blue, green, red, um, and the NIR new infrared band. And you can see those are all much cleaner, sharper imagery than the other ones. But you could also use these other bands to fit a model. Um, so what we're gonna do is select those four and make this data a bit easier to use um, and better for modeling. So I've got the names of these, BO2 blue, BO3 green. It's just what they're named in the paper. Also going to set this n bands variable. So we're using four bands out of the raster. 
And now we can just select those bands and plot them. You can see it plots a lot faster. And um, yeah. So these are the bands we're going to be passing through to flux.jl to um, identify the, um, the classes in the model. Now I'll set some, um, some variables. I'm going to use just 1%, I mean, 10% um, of the data we've got to make the notebooks run a bit faster. Um, but you can use more, probably need to use more than that to actually fit a proper model. That won't be enough to fit properly. Um, We'll use 20% of the data as test data. People know what that means. So we're going to keep 20% out and not um, run that so that we can check against it at the end. And we'll use 10% as validation to use at the end of the complete model run to make sure that our model actually works. So we've got a validation portion of 0 0.1. Okay. So now we're going to do some sampling, just randomized sampling from the paths to all the files. So hopefully you guys can see that. So I'm going to use this sample function from StatsBase. So we just pass the file paths to it. And I'm probably I could make this a separate. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to pass the file path and the length of all the files we've got times the proportion of how many files we want. Um, and sample with replacement. I mean, without replacement. So we don't want to get the same file twice. Okay. So you can see now we've sampled 10% um, of the files. We've got 1400 files, the file paths. Um, and I'm going to get the class of all those paths from the names of the directory, if that makes sense. So each of them has this annual crop forest directory name, and we'll just get that using base name, dir name. And this little circ means run these functions in order. So we run dir name first, base name, and we map this over all the sampled paths. So we get in the end this vector of classes to identify data. Okay, so now I'll get the number of tests. Oh, maybe I didn't set that up here. Okay. Where are we? Okay, so we've got the number of indices. I mean, we've got the indices to use in the test. So again, we've used this sample function. People kind of get what that does. Instead of using rand, we're just sampling from a vector of numbers. So we're sampling from the indices of the sampled paths. So we have just the numbers one to 1400, and we're sampling some fraction of them, which is n test. We want to have 280 files out of the 1400. So we just sample those numbers and we get the numbers um, that we want to use in testing. Um, so we can do the same in validation. And we want 140 files. But this time you can see I'm using this construct um, where I, I don't want to use any of the files that we've used in testing in validation, if that makes sense. We want these to be separate. So I go I for I in each index of the sampled paths if I is not in the test indices um, and run that sampling. And there we go, indices for validation. So we have 140 files we'll use for validation. Well, just the index of the file. Okay. Do the same for training. So for training, we just get all the other files left that we haven't already sampled. So that the remaining 70% using a similar function. Now I'm gonna wrap all these into a name tuple like uh, Simon described to you before. So we have a name tuple sampled indices where we have train, validate and test. So I can go sampled 
indices.test. Oh, our oh, sample indices. There you go. All right. So now I'm going to write a function, or we're going to write a function for building a raster series, um, basically a vector of raster files to use in training. So we talked a bit earlier about the laziness of um, rasters. So we also have this raster series object where we can load a lot of files at the same time into a vector and they can all be lazy. And in this case, we'll use um, this duplicate first keyword, which means we don't load any of the metadata of anything after the first file because we don't actually care about the X and Y coordinates for this kind of work. Um, if you care about the, those, they will be wrong in these files. Um, more often this is used when you have a time series and the X and Y is the same. Okay, so, so we make a raster series and then we're gonna do a bunch of lazy operations to change this data. Still none of it's been loaded from disk yet. Um, we're going to select the bands that we said before, the selected bands. So we just want these four bands, the blue, green, red, and near infrared. Um, we're gonna set the band, or before we do that, we're gonna set the band names to be actual names instead of numbers. And the last thing we do, I'm gonna name the raster. So we want the raster when we plot it to have the name of the class it belongs to so that we can check that the classes are correct, if that makes sense. So we're getting the class from the file path and we're making it the name of the file of the raster. Anyway, so we write a function to do this so we can run it over all the data sets. Um, now I'm gonna map over um, these sampled indices we have and um, First, we'll get the paths um, from all the paths that we have given the indices. So we're just indexing into this array of paths and we'll get just the paths back that we've sampled. Um, then we'll do the same with the class names that we made before. And then this next step is making labels so for machine learning, um, the labels of, of data are not, it doesn't understand, Flux doesn't understand names of data. So it can't be called agriculture or highway. It just has to be numbered. So in this case, it's gonna be numbered one to five. So we've got five classes. So we're gonna convert the labels of our data to the number classes. Um, and we're just gonna do that using this find first function and this equal equals C, where C is the class name um, from all of the classes that we have here. Um, okay, and the last thing we do is run that build raster function, um, build raster series to build, to build a series of all these rasters. Um, and um, so, we, so just as a reminder, sample indices is, Sample indices is this name tuple where we have the indices for training, validation, and testing. And we're gonna run, we're gonna map over all of these and run all these functions to organize our data and load the raster files. Um, oh, I didn't actually run that function up here. Okay. 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 Okay, so you might note that ran really quickly for loading, um, I think it's, yeah, 1400 files. That's because we didn't actually load them. It's, it's lazy with disk arrays. Um, 
So now we can have a look at that data. You can see as we've used map, used map the, the return value has the same keys as the data that we fed into map. So we have training, test, and validation. And you can see in data.train, Hmm. A little bit to show. Yeah. We have indices, paths, classes, and most importantly for modeling, we have labels and rasters. So we have all the labels numbered one to five of all the, the images and the paths to all the files as a raster. All the, yeah. So yeah, we have 980 training rasters. Okay. And just to show that these are rasters, we'll just plot one of them. Plot the first training raster just to check that everything's working. Okay, so it's herbaceous vegetation. And it's taking a bit of time to plot. Hmm. Plotting is taking a really long time today. I'm not sure, sure what exactly that is. Something with Pluto. Oh. So yeah, in our training set, we have rasters here, herbaceous vegetation and class. It's also named herbaceous vegetation. Yeah. Okay. Number two is highway. And Yes, you can see it's actually a highway. So the data has been classified properly. Okay. Okay, so up to now, we've just been getting all this data into um, Julia, loading all these rasters. And now I'm going to start on the flux.jl um, component. Um, flux works on um, larger rasters than this. So we have lots of individual slices, single, single 64 by 64 by four band arrays where Flux will work on multiple of these in a larger, like a tensor, um, which normally has another dimension. So we're gonna glue all these rasters together into a single array that is 1400 long. Um, and then we're gonna sample observations from that array where each observation is a single raster, but inside Flux, it's using the whole larger array. So they're not going to be rasters anymore at that point. Um, at some point, it would be nice to do this all lazily so that it, you could do larger than memory data sets, but that doesn't actually work currently. Okay, so we're going to, for Flux, we're going to set a batch size of 64, which means it uses 64 rasters at a time to do classification. And here's the function that is going to convert all these rasters into uh, something that Flux can handle. And um, there's a number of different ways to do this. You can probably write something better, but I'll, I'll go through and try and explain what it's doing. So we have the training rasters, which is a, is a vector of rasters. We're going to read all of those. So that means getting them from disk into memory. That's, it would be nice in future to not have to do that and for have to lazily read off disk, um, but that doesn't quite work yet. Um, I'm going to use this align function from Julienne arrays to just make a big array out of all the small, smaller arrays so we don't have to load them into memory multiple times. So it, it pretends it's a larger array. And from there, we're going to... Um, 
convert them all to float 32 because flux works with floating point numbers and our rasters are in uint 8 or uint 16. So, um, so if we go back up here, yeah, you can see we have, Sixty-four by sixty-four by four raster of u in sixteen um, with three dimensions. So that's a that's a small half size integer or a quarter size integer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what is stored within the TIFF. I think just because that's that's all the resolution they need in the. Yeah, if, if the raster was in floating point, it would load as floating point. But so the TIFF is stored as, as um, UN16, um, just so that it takes up less memory. If it was um, uh, UN64, it would be taking up four times as much memory for the data set. So they, they've done that to reduce size, but we need to convert that for flux because flux works on floating point numbers. Um, A read, yeah, read is just, it's actually just returning a raster series again, but it's replacing all the insides. Yeah, let's do that separately. Sorry. And, um, Okay, so let's run this. This is going to take a little bit of time because this is when we're actually reading those the 14,000 rasters from disk into memory and doing a few transformations on them. Oh, we're, we're cutting out just the layers that we want. Um, Yeah, so that's actually finished. So that took 14 seconds, which isn't too bad. Yeah, so you can see what we've got is a rasters.raster series, which is a, a series of rasters. Um, it's different to a vector in that it can have um, a dimension as well. Normally I use this for time dimension most common use case in this kind of modeling is to have rasters over a time dimension and you put them in a series and then you can index them by dimension. I mean, by the date or something like that. But in this case, I just use it because it makes loading the rasters much faster than if you load them all individually. And you can do operations like read on the whole series where it will read every single one, which that won't work on a vector. Okay. So it is the aligned function that's going to turn that into plain arrays. Well, so the aligned function will just join it together into, it's not actually turning it into an array, but it's like using like cat on all of the arrays, but it's just faster. It's just easier because you don't have to cat different dimensionality together. That makes sense. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just, I thought, I thought you said that to get you into flux, you needed to end up with just a plain array. Yeah. And I'm not sure where, at which point that's happening. Okay, yeah, so, so it's actually the broadcast that's doing that. So I'm doing that lazily. So there's just one copy to memory here. So this, where is it? So when I go broadcast float 32 dot align, that's converting the whole array into float 32 in memory. Um, if that makes sense. So that's when it becomes one single array that we can see above here. Okay. Get so it. often, yeah, you can use broadcast like that to change the type of a whole object. Um, so we're converting the whole thing to float 32 with that broadcast. I'm not sure did we talk about, I think Simon talked about broadcast, but using this dot before a function means that it's run over the entire array. So broadcast will get run. I mean, float 32 will be run over every single cell of the array. And then we get the same array out, but here you can have a, see the floating point numbers rather than in 16 numbers. Are there any other questions on this bit? This conversion? People basically get what's happening there. 
So in the end, we end up with this big multi-dimensional array we can use in Flux. And again, I'm no expert on Flux and the terminology there. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is convert these training labels to what's called one hot batch, which is a, a it's like a, a sparse array format. So instead of storing the number of the categories, we're just storing ones on this, this dimension of the array that correspond to the label. Does that make sense? So if we here, we had a label as three as the first label, and now we have a one in the position three on this axis. So this gives us a way of comparing the predicted results of the model. So the model is going to give us some number in that area that will you know, be 0 0.5. But we know, we know that this is highway or agriculture. And that's what these num numbers, these ones stand for. These are the known labels. You're right. Anyway, this is just the, the shape of the matrix that Flux wants. And we use this one hot, hot batch function to do this conversion. It's similar things in, in um, other um, frameworks. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is use this Flux data loader. Um, and what that will do is when we run a model, it will sample slices from this big array that we have and shuffle them around so it's taking a different set every time. So it's going to do shuffling, it's shuffle equals true, and collating them into mini batches with collate equals true. And batch size we defined before. Oh. Batch size is 64. So we're going to look at 64 images at a time. And you can see here, I've got this um, GPU method commented out. You could copy this data to GPU and um, run all these methods on GPU, but I'm not going to do that now on my laptop. But if you're actually doing this in production, you'd want to move all this data at this point to your GPU and run all the flux calculations on GPU. Um, and it will run in exactly the same way, but just be much faster. Um, especially if you have a good GPU. Okay, I'm going to do the same for the test data. Read it all. And for the test labels. But with the test data, we don't need to make it into batches. We just use it all as one big batch. Um, and we could, again, copy this to GPU, but... Yeah, so Flux accepts these test sets where you have the data and the labels together. The data and the labels that identify what... what um, the output should be. Okay. So the next thing, um, this model, um, I've converted this, I have to shrink my screen a little bit. I've converted this from a PyTorch model that um, Gail gave me because I don't really make models in this field. But from not really knowing um, Flux or, or PyTorch, these parts of Flux or PyTorch at all, it was pretty easy to convert this over. Um, the only differences I found were things like dense in PyTorch are called linear, but dense is what they call it in um, TensorFlow. So it's a pretty one-to-one -one conversion. Most of the functions are the same or similar to in PyTorch and TensorFlow. So if you have any background with using those tools, it should be relatively easy to transfer over to Flux. Um, mostly you'll find that Flux is much simpler and the code looks much nicer. In PyTorch, you have to write most of this out twice. You have to write the functions that you're going to use and then you have to write a function that has them in order. Where with Flux, we have this chain object. You can see what that is. And this is like, normally you would start with a much simpler model, but um, I'm not really demonstrating Flux. so. Um, we're looking at this kind of model um, and we're chaining together multiple models that do that manipulate the data um, with convolutions and pooling. So this is a convolution neural network that we're defining. And we're, we're chaining together all of these modifications to this array, that, this batch of arrays that we have where we'll 
do convolutions with like a seven by seven um, convolution. And some of them will, will shrink the number of bands. So um, combining layers. So here we're, we're moving from four bands to 32 layers. So we're actually expanding the size of the array and doing a bunch more convolutions. Um, yeah. People that do machine learning and do this kind of analysis will have to continue with what I've set up here and, and make this better for your use cases. This is not really, um, this is not totally my field, but um, the kinds of modeling I do, I don't think would be that interesting to you. <laughs> so I, I've given you this example. Um, it should be something to start off with. Um, most importantly, it runs. So first we're gonna test that this model that we've defined here, oh, I have to run the model first. Okay. So basically to understand what this does, it's, it's taking a large array, doing a series of convolutions over it, um, compressing the array and we're ending up with a, an array the size of the number of classes that we want to predict at the end. So here we're ending up with five classes um, and we'll, it will be a, a five by five, I think. No, so it, it will be a five by 64, which is the number of observations we do array, um, predicting which class the image is in. It makes sense. So, and th these will all be floating point numbers. So the number that's the highest will be the one that we think the image is. Um, this model is not going to do it right because we're not using enough data. Um, okay, so there we go. So the model actually does run on the training set. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to define a loss function. And use a cross entropy loss. You can see there are other options you can find in the flux docs. Um, there are a bunch of, there's a model zoo for flux where there are a lot of examples of these kinds of models that you can use and, and, and put together for different kinds of image recognition. Um, maybe I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there are other examples like this. Um, Okay, these are little helper functions. The important things we're gonna define now is like how many epochs, how many runs of machine learning we're gonna do in training and the learning rate to start out with and the optimization tool method, which is Adam at the learning rate. First thing I'll do is just see if Flux works at all with what we've set up. just over a single iteration. Maybe while that runs, we can look at the flux model zoo. Okay. We want to look at vision. Yeah, so you can see in the flux model zoo, there are all these examples of running um, convolutions. With um, different kinds of models from the ones that I've designed. But that workflow I've showed you getting rasters into that array will be the same for all of them. Maybe using a, a data loader or maybe using some other way of making mini batches. Um, but you'll be able to use that to get um, data into your models. Um, and yeah, look into Flux for, for more details on actually writing good models. Okay. Sorry. 
Okay. So you can see this is why you want to run it on a GPU or on a faster computer. Training takes quite a while, even with this 10% of the data set that I'm using. Yeah, you wouldn't use this laptop for this kind of modeling. And you probably wouldn't use a Jupyter uh, notebook either. You probably do this in a script, but you can just use this notebook as a script or convert it. There are converters. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I made a mistake. There is an RGB data set instead of the one with the uh, all of the bands, the thousand bands. And so the RGB is much smaller, right? Yeah. It does speed up the computation at the end. Um, and the, the notebook can be modified to that effect. Um, I managed to run it through. Um, I don't know if it will speed up the computation at the end because we by this time we've already compressed. It'll speed it up at the start. I think. Oh, yeah, because you are saying the size of the. Uh, because I'm already subsampling oh, yeah, from the data. And, yeah. Four bands, four bands. Yeah, yeah. I'm using four bands. So it's, it's nearly the same in the end. I see. Yeah. I guess it, the implication would have been that if we had used the smaller data set, you know, that can be sort of downloaded very fast. Yeah. Um, but so the thing is, we, it's JPEGs and it's not a very good um, I'm just saying, you know, example of most of the time, I imagine you'll be using TIFFs with more bands than just RGB. And um, with JPEGs, you could also just use any Julia image tools to load them. So you probably I'm wouldn't. I'm with you, but I'm, I was thinking yeah. essentially that for the final version of the notebook, maybe we'll make that an option that we explain it. For, okay. Yeah. Um, allowing people to not download the big data set, basically. Hmm. Just to start. Yeah. I think you can load those JPEGs with GDAL as well. That should just work also in rasters, but yeah. Um. Okay, so did training work? Yeah. Oh, did work. Okay, it doesn't print anything at the end. So, but we know training did actually work. So, um, <laughs> now we can run the whole training model over. We've got 10 epochs. And um, maybe I'll show you. And actually fit it on the screen. So this is just a pretty standard flux loop that a lot of the examples use where we're going to run that going to run the training multiple times. Um, and just do some checks, check if there are any NANDs and errors in the outputs. Um, and then we're, we're going to calculate the accuracy of our model against the test set that we defined before. So we've got 20% separated data and 70% of the data that we're actually running the model on. And for every iteration, we're going to check how good is the model and do we have to run it again? Um, is it getting better? Uh, if it's not, if it's good enough, we'll exit. Um, we're never going to hit 999 with this kind of classification model. So that will not happen. Um, but um, you could lower that. Um, we're also going to check if the model is improving, and if it's not, if it's if it's improved, we'll save the model to a file. So we've stored those um, the parameters, and uh, we'll also this this code has a bit of a test to um, to lower the learning rate if the model's not working. So over time, if the model's not getting any better, it'll learn more slowly. Um, yeah, let's run it and, um, that will be the end of using this laptop because that'll take quite a while. <laughs> okay. Um, do people have any questions about the, I guess the data pipeline and how any of that worked? Uh, in this kind of model, what is, oh, in this kind of model, what is the influence, for example, of the terrain that is beside the highway? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It might, yeah, it might have an influence. So you're going to have to tr train the model enough and maybe change this model in some ways to make it better if, if you have a problem where it's getting the wrong outcome. Yeah. 
yeah, because I'm, I'm seeing here the accuracy of uh, 20 at the end, right? The accuracy of 20 percent. Yeah, so it, it's going to have to use more data and do more iterations and, and maybe be modified to get better. 20 percent is what you expect at the start. That's just random. So over five categories, basically. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, there'll be some work to improving this and making it fit. Um, there'll always be some problems, like what about a highway through an industrial area? Like, because I was thinking if this, if this is one of the most used methods for land classification of, of or if they use some other method that are, is more accurate than uh, like spectral signatures, maybe. Yeah, there's probably a lot of different methods. Um, I'm I'm def I'm not an expert in this kind of modeling. I'm more often use the results of these models than make the the data. So um, yeah, um, I can answer more questions better about the data pipeline. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you could use a GPU to accelerate the, the processing. Um, how is the, the, the GPU support in this uh, Flux package? Uh, it's, it's actually very good. And this is one of the best things about Julia is most of the GPU stuff just works. And as you saw with the binary dependencies of the raster data, the GPU stuff is the same. It will install all the binaries that you need where in Python or something, you have to do all that setup yourself manually. You still have to install CUDA or some like system libraries for your specific card, but most of that is handled by the packages. I think it works on um, AMD, um, CUDA, um, NVIDIA GPUs. There's a maybe a less polished version for, for Metal, for um, Apple. GPUs and yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should it should work, um, but you might hit a few more bugs because it's young. Um, but so those backends are all abstracted. Um, so they'll work in the same way, but just work with different hardware. And then, um, yeah, we use these like array abstractions like GPU arrays. So it's also an abstract array and it works similarly to an array, but it's, it's housed on the GPU. And that GPU function I used will actually do the copying of the array to your GPU. Um, and then all operations on it will work on the GPU. Um, you can also use G GPU um, data just with your own custom functions. So just most Julia functions and broadcasts um, will work over GPU data as well. You just can't index directly into the array. Okay. Um, well, it's very slow to do that. It's, yeah. So in the operation is the same. Like you, you use that notation as you as you used. Uh, so the the operation the, the the way to do it is the same yes. for any yeah. for any uh, structure. So broadcasting over a GPU array using a function with that dot in it will work for any kind of array. If it's on metal, if it's on CUDA, and it's you can just write basic Julia code okay. as your kernels instead okay. of C or anything. Well, yeah. that's great. Yeah, it's, it's surprisingly simple. easy. It simplifies a, yeah. a bunch of stuff. Yeah. You don't need to keep in mind all the things that are on the GPU and are not. So it's OK. <laughs> and it, it, the data is available uh, for the rest of the Julia code without you needing to fetch it from the GPU. Yeah, well, you have, there's a function to move it back to the CPU. So the thing is, you don't want to be indexing into GPU code directly because it will be really slow. Yeah. So you might want to copy the whole array back to memory. So there's that CPU function that mm -hmm. um, Flux uses, but you can also just use like array okay. and the, the array and it will copy it to a memory array. So just the array constructor. So that makes sense. So um, we can just go array, my GPU array. If that makes sense, and that would copy it back to memory. And the other way around, if you say if you're using CUDA, you can go 
Um, makes sense so we've just copied doing that yeah. we copy the array from memory to the CUDA yeah it seems um, very simple yeah and then we can operate on that and you don't need that much GPU knowledge to use this I've, I've got a bunch of packages that run on GPU without a lot of low level stuff um, thank you very much you can also use rasters directly on GPUs They'll, they'll automatically convert. You can even use them as the, the as arguments. So you can do indexing and stuff on the GPU and that will all work. I use rasters quite a lot in GPU models like process-based models. Okay, so yeah, model isn't learning very much. It's dropped the, dropped the learning rate. <laughs> Hasn't dropped it any further. Um, so yeah, it's a challenge to people doing this kind of work to uh, make these better. <laughs> but hopefully the, um, the pipeline is, is useful. Um, okay. How are we for time? What's the... Hmm? Oh, really? Okay. All right. All right, so I didn't time that very well, sorry. Um, what else can we do? Okay, are there other things people wanna learn you can do with rasters? What kind of workflows do people have here? What? Any ideas? What do you guys? I was going to say, if I give you a set of uh, like sparsely distributed data set in a vector to bin average them over a polygon. So that means not rasterizing them, but just kind of grabbing them because they're in the polygon and then making uh, statistics of them. Okay, like zonal statistics. Yeah, I guess it's not rasters per se, but is, is it something we can think about? Mm. In a poly, yeah, well, it's still rasters because you need to have the, you need to know the, the X and Y coordinates to be able to map them from the polygon. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, I guess maybe it's more of a matter of uh, combining shape files with sparse data sets. So maybe it's not quite a raster mm. application. Of that. But if you, you can, like rasters can wrap a sparse data set as well. If you have something that's sparse, you can just make a raster. So it will basically assign them to a, to a grid point. And then yeah. you do your statistics there. Because a sparse array, if it's a sparse array, it's just like rasters doesn't know the difference between a regular array and a sparse array. It's just an array it can index into. So the statistics will, will be exactly the same. Oh, I see. That makes sense. So, okay. Make a new plot. So is there a function to make a random sparse array? Oh, like data. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, no, not really. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is more a vector operation. So that's something you could do with GDAL um, or like libgeos or something, I guess. That's, yeah, not really, not my expertise. <laughs> But not greeted. Uh, group them and make statistics of that. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, 
I started saying this and then I realized it doesn't really probably involve wrestlers <laughs> because it's not an array. Yeah. Well, so what can I do? Rasterization problem. Um, hmm. Let me just look at the docs. Maybe I can show you some examples of, of other kinds of modeling um, pipelines. Um, where are they? Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to do this in Vim because it doesn't really work in a notebook. Um, tell them there'll be a workshop on that later, later in the week. I think, are you doing time series detection later? Change a second, okay. Actually, have a whole GLM example. Hmm. Okay. I can make an example of, of extracting data at, at um, points. Is that interesting to people? There. I don't know what's interesting to you guys. I don't really know your field. Most of what I do is like really ecology specific. So, um, I can show you like extracting data from rasters at, at specific points using like um, point data. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. What else can I do? Okay. So I'm going to get here, collect a bunch of. Um, records from GBIF, maybe this is a bit too small, I don't know, which is just a package to get um, point data for um, species occurrences. This is a lot of what ecologists do. And you can see here, I can make a vector of coordinates from that data using the longitude and latitude columns of the data frame with coords equal. And I'm just skipping any missing data in the latitude at the same time. And that is actually, a, um, yeah. Okay, so again, like I've demonstrated before, I'll get use world clim.
and plot it. It's taking a little while. Okay, so I'm using that similar data set. Um, again, I'm gonna use the same syntax you can see here to cut out an area of the data. So this is a pretty common activity with rasters is to get a region that we're interested in, select the X and Y coordinates. And so, Can plot that region. Here you go, we have a, a limited area. I did that here. Okay, now I'm going to plot these points over that area just so we can see what we're working with. Just use a scatter plot in plots.jl or oh. use a bunch of keywords to set the plot keyword and, oh, when we build a plot like that, we have to display it. So you can see here, I've just plotted where these occurrences are on the map. Does that make sense? We've got a bunch of, of point coordinates and we've got some data. And um, I'm gonna use rasters to extract data from this, um, this um, raster stack into, uh, I think, into a CSV, yeah, okay. So I'll use the CSV package and um, maybe I'll use data frames as well, just so you can see. And this is an example of like the tables.gil interface that I talked about. So all these functions from rasters, if you extract points from them, that's a, it's a valid table that you can save to a CSV or you can copy it to a data frame because it conforms to that tables interface. Um, maybe we'll, we'll copy it to a, a data frame as well. So you can see here, this is just a, a vector of name tuples. Does that make sense? So we've got a lot of name tuples with the same name. The first is geometry, which is the geo interface standard for what the geometry object in a data frame is and the rest of these values from the BioClim data set. Um, so we've extracted the values from a raster into a table for specific point locations. Um, does that make sense to people as an operation? So we wanna know, yeah. Uh, what would happen if we have one dimension? Um, we have a time dimension? Yeah, well, you'd get a vector. Okay. Yeah, the return value would be a vector of that time dimension. So you would get, uh, a table of vectors over time. That makes sense. So yeah, uh, rasters at J will just extend all of these operations out multi-dimensionally. So if there are more dimensions, you'll get a vector or you'll get a raster back. So they will be plottable as well as a result. Um, um, we can also, yeah. You can copy that to a data frame. And see, there we have a data frame of this data from a raster. And basically all the outputs from rasters will work like that and the raster itself. So you get this interrupt between data frames and rasters. And we can just, um, write that to a CSV file very easily or, or any other kind of table file. Okay, that's, that's the thing. What else can I do? So, uh, what about if you have, uh, what about if you have like uh, a bunch of points, just like you showed, that you have some data for that those points, and you want to interpolate for a whole area? What do you mean by interpolate? Uh, so, imagine that I have right here in the island, I have like three weather stations in different parts of the island, ah, okay. and I want yeah, yeah, yeah. the I want the the values interpolated to cover the whole uh, island. 
So is that a, a, a pipeline yeah. in Julia that makes this faster somehow? So you probably want to do, yeah, I think this will be a question for Julia in the other course doing um, geostats. So this is the kind of thing you use geostats for and there's cridging and a, a lot of other tools for interpolating between mm -hmm. points. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you know. Okay. Oh, is it geostats? Yeah. So yeah, Geostats has a bunch of those kind of tools. Okay. And is, is that like native Julia or does it use something uh, something else? Yeah, this is all native Julia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like Rast is it's it's fairly easy to write all these algorithms in native Julia. So make it fast. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you tested whether the geostats interops with rasters? Um, yeah, we actually tried in the past. I think, I think um, Julio has implemented the um, geo interface now, and so a lot of stuff should work through. I think geostats is kind of built on meshes.jl. Um, I haven't tested that lately, and if it doesn't, that could be something we could um, workshop during the time here as a, as a hackathon. Yeah. Great, no other ideas. Should we wrap it up? I don't know what to do.